Thank you all. I'm Representative Chris Rabb, and I represent this district, the 200th Legislative District, Northwest Philly. Thank you all for coming. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Thank you to my members for, our members for coming out from across the Commonwealth. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today in my district. My district represents Chestnut Hill, where we are now. Um, and we're on the Chestnut Hill College campus, the Sugarloaf campus. Um, so thank you to Chestnut Hill College for allowing us to have this uh, important um, event today. Uh, we also represent Mount Airy, where I live, and part of West Oak Lane. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this policy committee hearing, where I will unveil what I call bold budget innovations to better leverage taxpayer dollars. Calling this year's state budget negotiations painful is a gross understatement. Passing a budget four months after it's due is simply unacceptable. But funding the services you pay taxes for through massive borrowing is a disservice to the people we took an oath to serve. Today we will explore topics such as universal basic income, municipal uh, job guarantees, carbon fee and dividend, and criminal justice reform proposals. And perhaps some of these ideas will percolate and come back to Harrisburg for further discussion in hopes of making a real change um, over time. And we brought with us uh, a number of experts from different backgrounds. But before I go any further, I, I really just want to say thank you to Chairman Sterla and your staff for making this possible. Um, and to my fellow colleagues in the, on the Democratic uh, Policy Committee uh, who've come from all over. This hearing should not only serve as a sounding board for reasonable and tangible budget solutions, but a catalyst to implement them. We can no longer remain stuck in a stupor of complacency, just as we can no longer accept things as they are. It is our duty to serve the interests of all the people of Pennsylvania, particularly the most vulnerable among us. This requires us not only to participate, but to lead. We are in the business of making change. I like to think so anyway. Um, and if we aren't up to the challenge, what are we doing? So let's begin our discussion. Um, so things are a little different because this policy hearing will touch on three different perhaps intersecting subjects. And the first one um, is, about is about economic security. And what does that mean? Well, in the context of the budget, we're talking about roughly $32 billion. And we see how it's being spent. And a lot of that money goes to help our most vulnerable. But from this past budget season, we've seen some real trying conversations and del deliberations about how our fellow Pennsylvanians are best served through the budget process and where the money goes. So this conversation that we're going to have first um, is about economic security and talking about at least two different ideas that are gaining steam um, in various corners of, of the planet, including parts of the United States. And one is the notion of a universal basic income. And to help us talk about this, uh, we have Professor Marinescu from the University of Pennsylvania. Please give her a round of applause. We'll have a seat. We're going to keep this conversational. All the written testimonies are available to you, and they're online. So we're just going to talk. And after we get through talking, we're going to bring on a virtual academic, a Professor Derek Hamilton, who is uh, Skyping in from New York. Get you another mic. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. So, thank you for um, joining in this conversation. Um, I want you quickly to to tell me um, what is your expertise at the university in general, um, and what do you bring to this conversation when we talk about a universal basic income? Because, frankly, I imagine a lot of people don't know. And it'd be great if you could just give a brief overview. 
So I'm an economist uh, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice. And my background is in public economics, studying taxes and government programs, as well as studying the labor market. So my specialty is in labor and public economics. I'm also a member of the National Bureau of Economic Research. So I come at this issue from an economics perspective. And for the probably majority of folks here who may not know what the universal basic income is, you know, frankly, that sounds pretty radical. Um, could you give us a brief overview of what that is and what that looks like? Yes, I'm happy to do so. So a universal basic income is, first of all, it's a cash transfer that we're giving to people. So that's the income part. And then it's universal, meaning that we are giving it to everyone within a geographic area. And finally, related perhaps to universality, it doesn't have any conditions attached with it, meaning that everyone, no matter their income, no matter whether they work or not, is receiving this cash transfer. The biggest example of this currently in the US, they don't call it basic income, don't get me wrong, but there is a scheme just like this in Alaska. In Alaska, every year through the permanent uh, fund, people receive about $2,000 in recent years per Alaskan resident, no conditions. This includes children, one year and older. For a family of five, this would represent $10,000 in the year that Alaskan citizens are receiving every year without any condition. I have to stop you because uh, I'm familiar with that. My mentor at the University of Pennsylvania was the first one to tell me about this many years ago, um, Professor Lamis. Um, but where does this money come from? Right, so in Alaska, uh, the money is coming from the Alaskan Permanent Fund. What is this? This is like a sovereign fund where the revenue from oil and minerals is being put into this fund in order to benefit future generations of Alaskans. So the money is not directly coming from oil, not directly, but indirectly through this fund. And then the fund is invested and the dividends, so the returns to these investments come back to the Alaskan residents. So that's how they finance this transfer in Alaska. And the discovery of oil was fairly recently. It's only, I mean, this was not like a, a long-standing policy. This was within the last, when was it? So, you know, the fund actually started to be dispersed in 1982. So it's been a while. This is something that has been in place for 30 years and Alaskans love it, and they're actually considering putting it in the Alaskan Constitution so that it can never be taken away from the residents. There's a lot of folks who weren't aware of something that's been around for 30 years. Some people consider that long, some people consider sure. it, it, it fairly new, but you're talking in the Commonwealth that has the second high, highest production of, of natural gas in the U.S., um, and so it's a, it's a very different conversation um, that they had in Alaska in the 80s and we're having now when we're just trying to get a tax on a uh, severance of shale tax. Um, so that's a very different policy approach that that state has gone to and, and it's not a particularly left-wing state. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so um, what are the normal critiques of, of this? Because when you said everybody gets cash, rich people get cash? So everyone. And I mean literally everyone. Everyone is eligible in Alaska. You just have to be a re legal resident of Alaska for the past year. That's the only condition. So that even includes legal refugees. So just to tell you, everyone gets it. So what's the, what are some potential problems uh, with that? Uh, you know, the advantage of it right, is freedom, that you, know, you have this uh, level of security. But you could say, what's the price of freedom? And one thing you might be worried about is that people aren't going to work. Because, heck, if I'm earning money with no strings attached and no conditions, like, why do I need to go, you know, and get, you know, tired at my day job? But you know what? You know, if you look at the evidence from economics, and that's, you know, a pet topic of mine because I work on the labor market and I've been working on it myself, the evidence very convincingly shows that such cash without conditions 
has a small to no effect on working. And we know this from multiple studies, including, and you might laugh, but have you heard of lottery winners? So that's a very interesting thing, because when you win the lottery, there is no condition. You get your money, no matter what you're doing, and it's an installment. So it's very much like a stream of cash that you get and get no matter what you do. So economists have been looking at this, and it turns out that when you look at this and you compare those who randomly win at the lottery, it's random, right? It's a lottery, and those who don't, well, those who win the lottery are essentially as likely to work. Almost no one stops working when they win the lottery. So of course, some people do, right? I mean, that's, but that's an extremely small sliver. Almost everyone, after winning $100,000, will keep working. Therefore, you know, for even smaller amounts, it is unlikely that such an you know, amount of cash would make any substantial difference in the probability that people will be working. So, that's one objection. Hey, it's going to encourage idleness. Another objection is about misspending. We give people cash, what are they going to do with it? What about if they spend it on drugs and alcohol and go out and commit crimes in our streets? Well, there again, the research is very reassuring on that count. First of all, there is no evidence that this cash is being spent on drugs and alcohol, but even more reassuringly, such cash can reduce criminality, and actually reduce drug and alcohol dependence, which I think is an important point given some of the crisis we're facing right now, for example, with opioid addiction that you might have uh, heard about. So it's interesting to think that giving people this economic security, that means, in conclusion, you're giving them freedom, and this freedom isn't being misused in terms of encouraging alcoholness or encouraging crime, drug, and alcohol abuse. Thank you.